Welcome to the Runners Connect, Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Lucas Felton. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Runners Connect, Run to the Top podcast. I'm your host, Lucas Felton. Many retired elite runners have found meaningful ways to give back to the sport to which they gave so much of themselves. One such runner is Australian marathoner Rob DiCostella. Known as a fierce competitor who never gave an inch to anyone, Rob raced marathons so hard that he often needed several months afterward to fully recover and be ready to race again. Rob trained in almost exactly the same way under the same coach for the best part of 15 years, something most of us don't get the chance to do. His training system is still a model for many Australian runners and coaches today. However, these days Rob is best known for his work with the Indigenous Marathon Project, a program that trains Indigenous Australians, or Aborigines as we know them, for races around Australia and ultimately the New York City Marathon. A few of the topics we discussed included the training program that took Rob to world championship medals and world records in the marathon, the practice of purposely going into hard workouts tired so as to get more benefit out of a shorter workout, and Rob's current work with gluten and sugar-free foods and the Indigenous Marathon Project. This is clearly a former champion who's desiring to give back to the country that supported him for so long. As usual, any resources mentioned in this podcast can be found at runnersconnect.net slash running interviews slash Rob DeCostella. I'm your host, Lucas Felton, and thanks for listening. So Rob, thanks so much for being on our show today. Can you start off by telling us a bit about yourself and how you got involved in the sport? Yeah, look, sure, uh, Lucas. It's uh, great to be able to join you. Um, look, I, I started running cross country as a as a schoolboy when I was about thirteen or fourteen years of age, and um, I was a bit of a, a plotter. Uh, I used to, you know, just represent the, the school in local cross-country races and uh, used to finish probably, you know, sort of in the 20s and 30s uh, against other other kids my age. But um, I, I just sort of persevered with it and, and luckily I, I got better and better. And then uh, by the time I was 16 or 17, I was winning schoolboy cross-country races, uh, set a number of national track 5,000, 10,000 metre, 3,000 metre national records and um, and then, you know, sort of was uh, s- selected in national teams to uh, first first off to compete in the World Cross Country Championships when I was about, uh, about 18, 18, 19 and then um, I just sort of continued from there and uh, then ran my first marathon just before the 1980 Moscow Olympics to qualify for, for the Olympic team and uh, went to four Olympics and uh, a number of Commonwealth Games and World Championships and um, had a, a number of good good wins and, and good races. So my career started off as a as a hacker and a plotter and uh, ended up as a world champion. Well, it was certainly a very good career. Who were some of your uh, early like influences or inspirations in the sport? Oh, uh, look, probably in the early days it was. Uh, the kids, the other, the other mates that I had that we all trained together. We had a, you know, a group. I went to a, uh, an all boys school as a, as a, a young fella, and um, had a, a group of mates. We used to just get together after school and, and do some training and stuff, and we had a lot of fun and got up a little bit of mischief and uh, and just enjoyed ourselves. And and then by the time I was about fifteen or sixteen, I. Um, was starting to be coached by one of the teachers at school, along with all of the other guys. But uh, but that that gentleman, Pat Clohessy, became my my coach and a and a mentor for me. And we we travelled the world together for the best part of you know another another fifteen years or so. And uh, and he he had a, a huge impact on me as as both an athlete and as a as a young man. Um, and then, you know, sort of all of the other um, parents obviously had a had a massive role. But I think as an athlete, it was um, the 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 coach that I had, but also the the guys that I I trained with. And you know, when you're competing and training as much as what, what I used to do, you're obviously spending a lot of time with your, your training mates. And um, and you know, it's a mixture of of 
being pushed in training sessions, but also the social and the enjoyable side of just making sure that you're really enjoying what you're doing and, and having as much fun as you can whilst you're training hard. Well, if you're not having fun, you kind of shouldn't be doing it, I guess. Yeah, well, that's, that's right. I mean, if it's um, it's obviously a lot of hard work and I don't think anyone necessarily enjoys the the tough gut-wrenching training sessions and, you know, the, the really long runs that you've got to do uh, week in, week out. But um, if you, if you you know, you've got a nice place to train and if you're running personal bests and you, you've got a good group of mates that you're training with, then it certainly makes it much more enjoyable and, and easier to, to get out there and do the hard work that you need to do. Absolutely. So can you tell us about your uh, your training system that you used? Yeah, look, sure. I mean, there's nothing particularly magical about it. It was um, it was based around two two long runs a week, so every Wednesday and uh, and Sunday, I do about a 30k run on a Wednesday and about a, a 35k run every Sunday. Uh, the Wednesday run was predominantly flattish and on the on a, a bike path or on a hard surface and. Uh, and invariably the last 5 to 8k we'd, we'd pick up the pace and probably be running um, probably you know sort of uh, 3 around about you know sort of 5 and a half minute mile pace whatever that works out in, in kilometers uh, and and Sundays were were run through the forest and the trails and a lot of hill running so you know really attacking the hills all the way through the run and again finishing on pretty strongly over the, the last the last few kilometers um, so they were the, the, I guess, the, the keystones of my training, and then around those were were some more quality sessions. So Tuesdays and Thursdays were always quality days, and um, and either on the track doing eight four hundreds with a two hundred meter float was a standard session I did all the way through my career. Uh, sometimes it was twelve laps of of sprinting the straights and jogging the bends. Um, or, or usually in the winter, that uh, Tuesday session would would be a hill session. So we'd do a a, five, a, a warm up and then a, a 5k surge, and then uh, probably about 5k of of hills, uh, and then a, a 3k warm down. Um, and in between, on Mondays and Fridays, they were just recovery days. So just a, an easy 16k on each of those days. And pretty much every day of the week, I, I train twice, so I'd always be doing a, a 10k morning run. Just you know, get out of bed and, and go out and, and jog 10k, and then most of the days we'd do the, the main session in the afternoon. Even on long run day, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, Sunday. Yeah, Sundays were usually, usually trained in the morning. Did the long runs in the morning, and just an easy an easy run um, in the afternoon. So maybe eight k on a Sunday afternoon instead of ten k. But um, always tried to train twice a day, and, and that was part of the the conditioning to to really. I mean, the, the second run in a lot of ways was more about just an easy jog recovery run. And uh, and helped me to to bounce back the following day to to do whatever I needed to do. Well, it certainly seemed to work out pretty well. So I wanted to ask. Yeah, you look, about yeah, that. Had, a, had a good. Go yeah, I mean, it was I, I was able to avoid any major injuries, and I think that that was a, a really important uh, attribute or or uh, a factor in in my development was, you know, I was a very strong, uh, had fairly strong legs, and and was able to withstand a fairly high amount of, uh, of mileage and training. And, um, and I think, you know, the consistency is, is absolutely critical, you know, to, to really get your body to adjust and develop, uh, whether it's the, the physiology or whether it's the skeletal muscular. Uh, you really do, do need the consistency and, and just being able to, to train year in, year out without having any major injuries and, and periods of... Uh, of, of non-training really, you know, laid really strong foundations for, for the marathon. Well, yeah, I would definitely agree. So I wanted to ask you about that, um, the workout, the 8400s with the 200 float. It's kind of known in Australian running circles as the uh, the quote-unquote quarter session. How did you and Pat Clohesse come up with that one? Uh, not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure where, where the origins came from. I mean, um, it's one of those sessions that we started doing when I was probably about 
17 or 18 years of age and uh, and, and it just became a, a regular session that I did all the way through my, my career. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people, you know, change their training, their track sessions and move them around a lot, but I always found it really helpful to, to just have a, uh, the consistency of doing the same session day in or week in, week out and being able to use that as a bit of a an indicator as to how I was coping with my with my training. And it was also a good indicator as to what sort of condition I was in leading into to major races and things as well. Um, but, I mean, the origins, I'm not sure. It was probably just convenient to, to run... 400 and um, and you know the 200 float you know obviously w was more interested in the combined time so you know we'd be running the fours in 62 to 64 seconds and um, and the and the float would be uh, about 40 to you know 45 seconds and then you you know try to really finish on the last the last uh, 400 as hard as you can and see if you can get close to 60 or you know get a little bit under 60 seconds for that last 400. Well, it, cer it certainly seems to be one of the uh, the benchmark workouts that every Australian runner still does to this day, which I find yeah, kind of well, interesting. Yeah, it, uh, it may, you know, my, my old uh, coach, Pat Clohessy, used to say it may not be the best training program in the world, but we know it works. <laughs> well, it certainly seemed to work for you guys. Did you yeah, find yeah. it difficult to maintain the three quality workouts a week plus two long runs? Um, not so much. I mean... Um, you know, we used to do you know Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday were all pretty pretty solid sessions, and then the long runs. Um, you know, it, it just seems it seemed to be something which I always did. Uh, and obviously, I mean, you'd be tired, uh, and you know, you often come up stiff and sore. But but just to to um, like the, the second sessions on each day just seemed to to help a little bit with with recovery. Um, and and you, know, you really did need to freshen up a little bit before any major races because you would be tired all the time. So you know, so the the, the freshening up over three or four days uh, before a, um, any sort of a race was a really important part of just making sure that you could race really hard and get the best out of yourself in the in the race situation. Um, but again, you know, maybe it was you know just part of the the attributes that I had to, to be strong enough to, to handle that sort of uh, program. I think we're running somewhere between, you know, like 220 to 230K a week or, or thereabouts. Um, and, and that was, you know, something that I did, you know, pretty much for the best part of a decade or so. Well, <laughs> with that much volume, I would imagine you would uh, certainly be disinclined to hammer anything too hard. Well, the track session's... We're, we're pretty short and sweet. You know, some people seem to spend you know hours between their track sessions and be on there for for ages and ages. You know, we do our warm up, get onto the track, do a couple of laps of uh, of strides and spikes, bang out the session, which would be you know sort of 14 or 15 minutes, and and then we'd be we'd be out of there. Um, so um, you know, to to do eight 400s is not a a huge track session by most people's standards, uh, but I think on top of the the mileage and the and the training that we'd be doing on the other days, it was just enough to to you know really sharpen us up and give us a chance to develop uh, a lot of the the anaerobic aspects of uh, of our fitness that we needed. Well, again, it certainly seemed to work for you guys. Yeah, and the races also were a really important part of of the program as well. You know, some people don't seem to race very often, but uh, you know, sort of almost every opportunity that I had to to race, I'd find a a, a race to to jump into, and um, and that was, you know, you can always push yourself harder, or I could certainly push myself harder in a race than what I could in training, and um, and just freshen up for a couple of days before it, uh, have a good hard race, and and still on the Sunday you'd be out there still doing your your long run the next day. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. You uh, you actually keep beating me to the punch on a lot of my questions. Um, I was going to ask, how did you, uh, you, you know, like like a lot of guys in your era, you uh, you raced a lot and at a lot of different distances and disciplines, a lot of cross country and road stuff and some track. How did you adjust? Did you have to adjust anything for any races, or it sounded like you pretty much trained on all surfaces at all the times? 
Yeah, pr- pretty much. I mean, the only real difference was that in in a, a track season, I'd be doing two two track sessions a week, and um, in the, the the cross country or road season, then the, the the Tuesday track session would would be, be a hill session. Um, so you know that was really the only adjustment, and and you know my approach was that um, you know if you're fit, you 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 run well anywhere. And and that worked for me. I mean, some of my best marathons were were run off a off a, a southern hemisphere track season, and and running. You know, if I could run a, a a PB or close to my PB for five k, and still do the mileage that I was doing, then I I always knew that I was I was going to be in good form for for a good fast marathon, and that and that invariably worked out. I think you know when you're fit, you're fit. And, uh, and and when you fit, you run well in whatever whatever event you go to the starting line, whether it's a fifteen hundred metres or or a marathon, um, and and that worked for me. May, you know, maybe because my training was always uh, focused at the at the longer events and the endurance and the and the strength strength aspects. So uh, it, it worked really well. Well, again, certainly seemed to. So over your career, which was you know, most of the 1980s and into the early 90s, there were a lot of different shifts and changes in running information, like, uh, you know, shoes and food and diet and things like that. And the messages that were, that came out seemed to contradict each other quite a lot. How did you, you know, figure out which, which ones, parts of these new information was going to work for you or were just not going to work? Well, I mean, uh, it was uh, the the diet side was was interesting. I mean, I was always interested in uh, in how how best to fuel the the body, especially for the marathon. So so back through the through the eighties was the the real uh, depletion carbo-loading approach to 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 marathons, and and I worked closely with um, exercise physiologist and applied nutritionist Dick Telford. When uh, when I was working at the AIS with him, and uh, and he was always you know a bit of a pioneer when it came to to sports nutrition, so so you know I used to follow a modified depletion and and certainly a carbo loading approach, um, and and that seemed to work. We also experimented a, a bit with with drinks during the marathon and, and back in those days there were no such things as gels or, or anything like that. You know, you you maybe had a little bit of an electrolyte drink but uh but there wasn't a lot around. And, and and even when I first started running marathons in the early eighties, uh there was still debate about whether you needed to drink at all in a marathon. <laughs> so there were a lot of marathon runners that just ran the full the full forty two K without having any drinks. Because they figured that, that it wasn't wasn't necessary. So, Sounds so like a rough things, day. Yeah, yeah, things have changed a fair bit. <laughs> but um, but I remember, you know, Dick and I would, would experiment with uh, this, um, you know, a, a polymer, long chain polymer of, of glucose called polycose, and and he he tracked that down because it was it was a a food or as a supplement that they were using. In intensive care units within hospitals to to uh, sustain patients that were in comas, and and it was basically just a very high glucose, uh, almost like a, a gel type type approach. Uh, so you know we started experimenting with this and using this during races, and that seemed to work quite well. And then you know we we just tweaked it depending upon the, the humidity and the temperature and um, and what the conditions were like and uh, and you know I was always as a sports scientist or as a scientist with a background I was always interested in in trying new new things and um, and experimenting and seeing whether whether you could find a better way to recover or a better way to to finish on strong. Um, so, you know, things have changed enormously, you know, shoes also, um, you know, I used to race in very lightweight shoes and, and because I'm fairly, fairly heavy, I used to race at about 68, 70 kilos, uh, in, in super lightweight shoes, my, my feet would get pretty smashed around and, and, and beaten up during, during marathons. Uh, but, you know, I'd always prefer to, to trade off the, the weight. 
uh, for the weight and the and the support, um, and and you know as a consequence of that, ended up you know sort of knocking my, my toes and, and feet around a bit. But um, you know when you when you're racing, it's it's just incredible what you're able to endure and withstand, uh, and and that's part of the I guess the mental the mental toughness that you need to to compete at that level. Yeah, I've um, I've talked about I've talked to a few different. Uh, Guys, guys who ran and who ran at the, at the top level in your uh, in your era and that in the '80s there, and a lot of them have said the same thing that uh, yeah, racing just brings out a different kind of a different well, for lack of a better term, a different animal in every in every person competition. Yeah, look, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, you you know, your training is training, but but when you go to the start line of a race, uh, you you really do have a uh, a capacity to 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 do so much more and uh and and that you know the competition or the intensity or you know the fact that you're just freshened up for a few days right. uh really really allows you to to go up to an, another level and and that's i think the the great thing about it maybe that's one of the reasons why um you know it used to take me so long to recover from from hard marathons, you know, I'd, I'd really knock myself around and and deplete my 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 uh, reserves to an extent where uh, it'd take me a good ten to ten to twelve weeks to to really you know sort of get back into full training again. Yeah, that uh, like I've seen videos of some of your races, and I can I can very well understand that. How did you how did you mentally approach races and competition? Any specific strategy? Uh, no, not not particularly. I mean, um, you know, I I sort of um, had an approach that if I could just run as fast as I could, then I'd run as well as I could and end up finishing as high as I could. So in a lot of ways, the the, the race was uh, whilst it was against the competition, it was also very much against me, and and trying to just get the best out of out of myself. Um, having said that, there, you know, there, there is definitely a uh, an intensity and a rivalry of of competition against the other the other top runners, and and that and that what that's what kicks in over that last few k when when you are running shoulder to shoulder with with someone and you you really have a, an ability to to lift and, and go to another level and and you know really pull out something something special that you never knew was there. Um, in terms of the preparation, I mean, you know, staying positive and and being optimistic and um, and just you know sort of uh, not allowing any negative thoughts to to enter into into your your consciousness is a really important thing. Um, it's it's just so easy to to undermine your your performance by allowing negative things to to come in. So. You definitely have to have the mental discipline to maintain a positive focus and and uh, and perspective on on what you're doing out there when you're competing, um, and and you know I think it maybe comes partly with the the training and the and the fact that you've you've committed and you've worked so hard to get to the start line that uh, you're really you know absolutely committed to to doing your very best out there. Well. Like again, yeah, with especially with a marathon because it takes you. You have to be focused on kind of one thing for several months at a time. So it's uh, it, it's definitely worth you know, trying to get to the start line in the first place. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah. So I'd like to switch gears a bit to um, like what what kinds of things have you done since you retired? Because that was kind of a while ago, and you, my research indicates you've been pretty active since then. Yeah, look, um, uh, I um, the first the first transition post running I had was when I moved back here to to Australia and and settled back in Canberra and and um, and took up the position as director of the Institute of Sport here um, and I held that position for about five years and then um moved out of the the elite sport area into to addressing uh, a social health area and established a charity called smart start for kids to to address childhood obesity um and and that charity's still going which is about 15 years ago 
uh, and then um, about uh, eight or nine years ago, I started a, a health food company called Duke's Health Food, uh, which provides um, uh, grain-free, which is obviously uh, grain and gluten-free foods, and, and we use a lot of ingredients that are really high in natural proteins and, and very nutritious. So, so any people with uh, any sort of compromised health or any people who are interested in high performance get a lot of a lot of benefit from from those um, those products, and um, uh, and then the other big thing which I've done more recently is uh, the Indigenous Marathon Project (IMP), which works with a group of young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island men and women each year, and uh, and we train them uh, running training for about seven or eight months. And and then take them over to New York and they run the New York Marathon. But we are basically just using the marathon as a as a way to to really drive a lot of uh, personality and, and character development and change to to demonstrate to themselves and to a lot of others that they they can do incredible things with their lives. And then we we also work with them to get them through a cert for in health and leisure. So, so they can go back to their communities and um, and back to their families, and and address a lot of the the health and social issues that that we face with uh, with Indigenous Australians. Um, we've got a massive disparity between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians in uh, in a whole range of areas, from chronic disease through to youth suicide and incarceration and employment and education, and um, and IMP is providing a, an opportunity for, for some of these young inspirational leaders to, to really uh, you know, drive a lot of, a lot of uh, grassroots change within, within their communities. Well, yet again, you beat me to the punch. That was going to be one of my next questions. <laughs> I did want to ask about the, um, about the, the grain and gluten-free uh, health foods uh, stores. Sure. How did you get into that kind of thing? Uh, well, my my wife, um, has, when she was younger, was struggling with chronic fatigue, and uh, and a friend of ours, uh, who's a clinical a clinical biologist here in Canberra, uh, who treats people who have autoimmune disease, uh, and and he he worked with uh, with Teresa to to help her get over her chronic fatigue. And uh, and one of the big things that um, he gets a lot of his his patients to to do is to remove grains from their diet, uh, and and basically the the grain removing grains seems to uh, give your immune system a bit of a reboot. Uh, there's a lot of substances in in grains that tend to to overwhelm or undermine your own immune uh, immune system's ability to be able to function effectively. And whilst, you know, sort of there's a, a massive grain industry, all the wheat, rice and corn and, and so on, um, there's also a lot of, of natural toxins in those plants. And, and when you remove all the grains out of your diet, all of a sudden your immune system starts to, to focus and, and, and fight the viruses that you, your body's been struggling with. Um, and uh, and Bill, uh, who, who's this, this friend of ours, Bill Giles, uh, is treating a lot of people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But uh, we really felt that that by producing the the bakery uh, and the health food company, would be able to help him get his message out there to more people and and help people who have any sort of immune system, immune related illness or disease and. And that goes from everything from you know sort of uh, arthritis and skin rashes through to to life-threatening disease like like cancer. So he's had a, a lot of um, a lot of success helping people to to get back uh, back on track and improve their health. Uh, so you know that's pretty much how it started, and uh, and now we're expanded out beyond just um, just breads, which was what we we started with. But now we have a whole range of different. Uh, cafe foods and um, and sweets and desserts and and savoury products and and other things. So, but everything is grain free, and we use a lot of uh, quinoa, which is a, a an incredibly nutritious 
seed uh, from primarily from South America, and it's um, it's it has a, a lot of wonderful nutritional benefits for for people who um, you know sort of uh, still you know need to get all the protein and, and nutrients that they need. So is this something that you use in in kind of in uh, at the same time with with the Indigenous Marathon Project? Because you talked about um, how obesity is kind of a uh, is kind of is one of the issues that you're trying to combat there. Yeah. Look, um, I'd like to be able to, but a lot of our our indigenous runners come from pretty remote and isolated areas, and and being able to to supply and provide uh, grain free foods to them is very difficult. But certainly, as part of the education that they that they do, um, we we certainly provide them with an understanding, especially around sugar and around around fructose, um, and you know there's a massive Massive consumption of uh, of soft drink and and fruit juice and other very sugary drinks throughout Indigenous communities, as as there is throughout all all Australia, <laughs> but uh, but Indigenous Australians especially uh, seem to to have massive massive sweet tooth and and massive uh, consumption of these things, and I think that that's that's uh, not a, not a good thing for anyone. Uh, so you know, we we really try to provide the the education and the understanding of some of these things, and and a lot of our our runners take that on on board and uh, and you know try to to raise awareness back back home about some of the the health consequences of uh, you know having having two liters of coke every day, which is not very good, especially when you're about 13 or 14 years of age. It's not good at any age, I would say. No, and uh, and that's and the the problem with sugary drinks is is not just unique to Australia. I uh, I have a couple friends who could stand to to cut down on their on their soft drink consumption. <laughs> yeah, look, it's it's very addictive, and and I think um, there's you know there's a, a growing awareness these days of of just how dangerous and and how addictive sugar and especially fructose sugar is. Um, and and I think we're going to over the next decade, decade or so see even even more uh, acknowledgement and uh, and you know more promotion of of trying to eliminate and reduce that out of out of our diets and especially for our young kids um, you know I think that there's a lot of a lot of not just physical health but emotional consequences of um, you know, massive consumptions of sugar and especially. When you combine it with a, a sedentary lifestyle, so it really is a double whammy. Uh, kids sitting around playing computer games and, and not getting out there and being physically active on the one side, and then on the other side they're having uh, increasing levels of uh, of sugar and, and fructose in their diet. So I think it's um, it's a, a very you know a very toxic situation. Again, it certainly could be if um, and. Let's hope it gets it get, continues to get addressed as you or as you're trying to do. I was going to ask what kind of what kind of success rate do you think you're having with with your indig with the indigenous um, education programs you put on? Oh, look, I, I think it's I think it's having a massive impact um, from you know what we're seeing. You know we've um, we've been going now. This is our fifth year, and in the last four years we've we've taken thirty two. Aboriginal and Island men and women to the finish line of predominantly New York, but but also uh, if they if they get injured or something leading up to New York in November, then we give them a chance to to keep on training, and we'll take them to either Tokyo in February or or uh, or Boston a couple of times in April, so that they you know they they don't miss out. Uh, certainly, you know, not not because of injury or or circumstance. Um, so you know, before we started four years ago, there were virtually no Indigenous men or women who'd ever run a marathon, uh, let alone a, a major international marathon. So so now to to have uh, over 30, and we've got another um, eight that we're looking to to bring over to New York um, in a couple of weeks' time, or in a few weeks' time to to run over there. Uh, so the 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 uh, the developing a, a culture and an interest in distance running is really good and we're seeing a lot of 
a lot of kids in the communities getting out there and, and starting to become much more physically active. We're seeing fun runs in communities starting to, to, uh, to happen. A lot of our runners themselves are now organising fun runs and training groups for, for the, uh, the school kids, uh, for the, the footy teams, for some of the older people in the community just getting out and walking 5K. On a, on a weekly basis or a couple of times a week is, uh, is, a, is a, a massive change to, to what has previously been happening. And um, I think it's also one of those things that, you know, when you, when you run a marathon, there's nothing like getting yourself through that last 10K. And when you do cross the finish line, the, the sense and the feeling of achievement and accomplishment is, uh, is just almost overwhelming. And, and we want our runners to, to be so proud of what they've done, proud themselves, but also for their families and communities to be proud of them. And then to, to use that, that pride to, to motivate themselves to, to go on and, uh, and go back to university or, or, or go to university. We've got you know, a couple of our graduates who, who have never been to university but when they finish the marathon and through the education program that they do with us, then went back to and, and, and enrolled in university and have now gone on and are doing nursing and, and other things at university. Um, we're seeing our runners who have now got the confidence to, to apply for, for jobs that they never would have even thought that they could have done before. And, and through that, they're, they're sending out you know, a massive example to, to other other kids in the family or other people in the community and, and I think that that's uh, a really powerful a powerful message to just realise that um, you, you do have this incredible capacity to do amazing things but you've got to work hard just like you do training for the marathon, you've got to be prepared to, to uh, push yourself and you've got to be consistent and you've got to be dedicated but, uh, but when you do set yourself a goal and you work hard to achieve it. When you do achieve it, you feel so proud of yourself. And we want to really use that as a as a metaphor for motivating and encouraging other other young uh, Indigenous Australians to to take on challenges in their life. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be running. It can be anything. But uh, you know, there's not too many things that are as hard as running a marathon in six months, especially when you know a lot of them have never done any running before. So they've gone from virtually no running to, to finishing the New York Marathon in, in six months. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty significant achievement. That's, I agree, a very powerful message and a very powerful uh, uh, achievement and, and sense of achievement that, that can definitely power someone through a lot of things. So just, I just yeah, and there's a lot of, I mean, if people are interested then you know, I mean, there's a, a lot of uh, profiles and stories and photos and things on our website and, I'd really, you know, encourage anybody who wants to learn a little bit more about about uh, the Indigenous Marathon Project just to to Google um, uh, IMP or Indigenous Marathon Project, or just go to our website, which is imp.org.au, and uh, there's a whole host of information there. Well, we'll definitely post a link to that on the uh, on the page for this interview. So I just have a couple more things for you because I know you have a busy day still. Um, one, how do you think more people who run can maybe be turned into fans of running? It can be a long answer, but just give the short version. <laughs> uh, fan, people who, who run or people who don't run? People who run. There's, I'd say there's a lot of people who run and who, and who run races to finish them, but most of them don't really know a lot about, say, the elite side of the sport or you know, any of the history of the sport or any of that. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, it's a good question, isn't it? Because uh, you know the, the the fun run side of of the sport is going you know gangbusters. You know, it's seeing huge numbers, and you're seeing things like the color runs and and other things taking off. But uh, the elite side uh, in a lot of a lot of places is really still struggling. I think it's it's probably has to come through um, you know at a at a young age. It's very difficult for someone in their 30s or 40s to to all of a sudden you know start to to really focus on the on the elite and high performance end, but um, I think you know sort of when you're you're 12, 13, through to 16 or 17, 
if we can encourage kids at that age to start to to um, you know follow some of the the elite runners and and start to to look at the some of the the track meets in Europe or or some of the the big marathons and and start to really take an interest in in some of their local national runners as well. Uh, hopefully that that might spur them to to take a greater interest and then follow that through throughout the rest of their lives. But it's incredibly competitive, isn't it? The, the you know so many. Um, high performance and, and elite sports out there that that are big professional sports that are, are driving the, um, the the membership and enthusiasm and, and marketing and we probably struggle as a as a worldwide sport to do that very well in distance running. Well, again, it's it kind of all, a lot of things go back to you got to start people when they're young. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think you know when when you're young and you're impressionable, and uh, you know for for mums and dads to to encourage their their kids to get out there and and you know run cross country, you know run run track, go in a couple of of fun runs, and um, and hopefully you know sort of the the, the local sports stars um, are are able to to inspire and, and connect with some of the, the young kids coming through. I know, you know, certainly you've got in Australia guys like Michael Shelley who just won the Commonwealth Games marathon in Glasgow, um, is is now inspiring a whole new generation of young kids to to start to take an interest in, in running. And he's such a, a wonderful um, a wonderful young man uh, I think you know whether you're a parent or or whether you're a teacher or if you're if if you're responsible as a coach for a group of young people, um, you want you want people who have that that wonderful personality and character that you you want your young kids to look up to and follow. Yeah, it's definitely a uh, they can definitely be a powerful driving force, like you were saying with other things. So my last thing I want to ask you is is just is a quick uh, like a quick five questions. Um, what was your pre-race meal? A uh, little bit of steamed fish. That's that's a first on this show. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite workout? Um, the my long runs, the, the Sunday Sunday long run. What was your favorite race event to do? The Boston Marathon. What would you do for fun during your elite career? I read biographies of some of the the world's greatest distance runners. Yeah, reading reading's been a common answer too. And uh, and what race would doesn't you Doesn't take loved... too much energy. <laughs> yeah, right. <You're> exhausted. <laughs> and finally, what race would you have loved to run but never got a chance to? Comrades. Yeah, that's yeah, not again, a pretty unique answer. A uh, not a lot of not a lot of people have desired to run ultra marathons like that. Well, it's uh, it's it was at a, an era. I mean, I, I was competing obviously through the apartheid period and um uh trained, you know, trained with with uh, Mark Platchies in in Boulder when I was living over there and um and got to know Sydney Marie who was a a black South African 1500 meter runner. But um, we were, as elite athletes, never permitted to compete in South Africa during during all of my career. And um, over since then, I've um, had a, an opportunity to you know learn a little bit about the, the comrades and um, uh, both from a uh, the, the history of the event, but also I think from the the. You know the origins of the event through to to the history of the event. It's something which you know I, I would have have loved to have um, have done while I was at my peak. Well, it's certainly a very unique challenge for anybody who uh, who feels up to it. I'll uh, well, you'll have to, everybody will just have to go research exactly what the comrades uh, comrades marathon is. Yeah, yeah, I think it's um it's it's one of those special events. Certainly. Well, Rob, I really appreciate this. Um, thank you very much for for your time today. I know I, I know you have a very busy day ahead of you, so I'll uh, I'll let you get back to that. But no I, I really appreciate it. My my pleasure. Nice nice having a chat, and all the best to you and your listeners. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Cheers. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Bye bye. 
This has been a Runners Connect podcast. We'd love it if you could leave a short review on our iTunes page to let us know what you think of our podcasts and how we can make them better for you. Also, if you have a question about this episode or any other, please don't hesitate to ask. You can leave a comment on the webpage or leave us a voicemail at 617-356-7969. We'll do our best to answer as many of these questions as we can, either in a future episode or in one of our monthly Q&A sessions. I'm your host, Lucas Felden, and thanks for listening.